me, what is really important is here, for the first time really ever, we have evidence that people can store information outside of the human brain. It is the birth of a new type of human culture. More complex, but easier to pass on from generation to generation. Sixty thousand years ago, our ancestors emerged with new technology and new culture. Thousands of years of drought had forced them to change. They were ready to explore the world. As the climate improved, they started to stream out of Africa. They might have been surprised to discover continents already populated by other humans, remnants of earlier, more primitive migrations. As they moved into Asia, they might have come across Homo erectus or the tiny hobbit. There's no evidence for such a meeting, but there is one encounter we can be more certain about. As a separate wave slowly moved through the Middle East into Europe, they must have met the Neanderthals. What were those meetings like? For many years, scientists speculated that early Homo sapiens populations absorbed the Neanderthals through interbreeding. If they did, there would be traces of Neanderthal DNA in our genes today. But there was no way to detect Neanderthal DNA until researchers at the Max Planck Institute set out on a daring scientific odyssey, the quest to sequence the Neanderthal genome. The human genome contains approximately three billion chemical bases, the A's, T's, C's, and G's that make up our genes. Mapping that was hard enough. The idea of mapping the genome of a long extinct species seemed pure fantasy. But that didn't stop Svante Pablo from dreaming about it. The first problem was to get DNA from Neanderthal bones over 30,000 years old. In most cases, DNA degrades steadily over time, leaving only minute fragments. My group is involved since over 20 years now in developing techniques to retrieve ancient DNA from fossils and old bones. And of course, always a dream was to do the Neanderthal, our closest relative. But finally, taking great care not to contaminate it with their own, they isolated the first piece of Neanderthal DNA. Svante's dream is now a reality. He and his team have made a draft of the entire Neanderthal genome. Now scientists all over the world can compare key parts of it to the human genome and one such comparison is already giving us deeper insight into the Neanderthal brain, the gene called FOXP2. It's the only gene we know of today that's involved in speech and language development in humans. We know that because if one copy is lost in a human due to a mutation, we have a severe speech problem. When first discovered, FOXP2 created a lot of excitement. Although many animals have the FOXP2 gene, the human version is unique. Some thought it was the gene for language. We now know that complex traits like language are controlled by many genes. Yet researchers agree the human version of FOXP2 is closely tied to some of the basic motor skills necessary for speech. And the big question was, of course, is that shared with Neanderthals or not? 
And when we now look at it in the Neanderthal, indeed it looks to be identical with us. It's tantalizing evidence that despite their mental limitations, the boy from Skladina and his people may have been able to speak. If we share the capacity for language with the Neanderthals, could we both have inherited it from the same source? A common ancestor who gave rise to both species. Who was it? With a technique called the molecular clock, scientists can now find out. That's because DNA mutates or changes at a surprisingly regular rate. By counting the differences in the genetic code of Neanderthals and ourselves, simply comparing the A's, T's, C's, and G's in our DNA, scientists can calculate how long the two species have been diverging. We can then estimate when there was a common ancestral population, where some individuals went on to become modern humans, some went on to become Neanderthals. It is in the order of, say, 300,000, 400,000 years ago. The timing points straight to the intriguing ancestors who left Africa half a million years ago and buried their dead in the hills of northern Spain, leaving a distinctive pink hand axe at the spot. This is Homo heidelbergensis, who we now know is our ancestor, too. In Europe, they evolved into the Neanderthal. In Africa, groups that had not yet migrated evolved into Homo sapiens. So DNA is revealing we share a common ancestor with the Neanderthals. But do we carry some vestige of Neanderthal DNA in our genes? Proof that we absorb them by interbreeding. Some people claim that there are some hybrids of Neanderthals and modern humans. In the, in the genetical record, we don't see clear evidence of that. The big story is that there were Neanderthals, they were replaced by other people, and, and, and after a, a rather short time, we don't see any trace of the Neanderthals in Europe. And certainly today, we don't see really traces of Neanderthal genes. With no evidence of interbreeding, it now seems more likely that as our population grew, we simply push the Neanderthals out of their environments. Humans have a very intensive way of using the environment. We seem to have the ability to pump out lots of babies, and our babies seem to have a high probability of surviving. So population growth is a really important part of the, of the human adaptation. The arrival of Homo sapiens was not the only thing the Neanderthals had to contend with. Europe was gripped by wild climate swings. The Neanderthals were already struggling to survive. Probably the density of Neanderthals in the, in the landscape uh, was very low. And there was a good reason for that. Neanderthal technology was limited, and their energy needs were huge. They had this big body, this big brain, living in a rather cold environment. So we, we have estimates of their uh, energy consumption every day. It's about 